It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Have you ever met someone who overcame self-doubt and turned their challenges into opportunities? Building mental strength is a lot like building physical strength. You need good habits. According to today's guest, Amy Morin, when you give up the things that are holding you back, you can accomplish incredible feats. Amy is here today to discuss strategies women can use in order to exercise mental and emotional strength. Amy is a licensed clinical social worker and psychotherapist. She is the author of the national bestseller, 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do, as well as 13 Things Mentally Strong Parents Don't Do. Her TEDx talk, The Secret of Becoming Mentally Strong, is one of the most viewed talks of all time. Amy is the author of 13 Things Mentally Strong Women Don't Do, Own Your Power, Channel Your Confidence, and Find Your Authentic Voice for a Life of Meaning and Joy. Welcome, Amy. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks so much for having me. So, Amy, women are finding the confidence and the courage to speak out on critical issues today. You wrote a book, 13 Things Mentally Strong Women Don't Do. How do you define a mentally strong woman? So uh, mental strength is all about being able to think in a way that's realistically so that you're not overconfident, but you're also not filled with self-doubt. It's about knowing how to manage your emotions so that you can use your anger to to fuel you to create change or that when you're sad, you can take steps to boost your mood. And it's about knowing how to take positive action so that when, no matter what kind of circumstances you face, you know that you can take a step to either make your life or somebody else's life a little bit better. So your work is around helping people become mentally strong. How did you get started on this journey? So I started as a psychotherapist, and I thought, okay, I'm going to start my my work based on everything I'd learned in college and things that I learned in these textbooks, and I uh, was excited to teach other people how to be mentally strong, but I didn't realize how much I was going to need it in my own life. And shortly after my career began, my mother passed away suddenly from a brain aneurysm, and it really set me on this path to study mentally strong people, uh, not just to help people in my office, but also to help myself. I wanted to know how come some people went through struggles and they and they came out on the other side stronger versus why did some people seem to just get stuck in life? And uh, a few years after my mother passed away, it was three years to the day, in fact, that my 26-year-old husband died of a heart attack. And... Again, at that point, I knew, all right, it wasn't always about what people did. Sometimes it was more about what they didn't do. And I had learned that sometimes it just takes one or two bad habits to keep people stuck. And so it set me on this path to identify what are the bad habits that keep people stuck. And a few years later, my father-in-law was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And I wrote my list. It was a letter to myself of the 13 things mentally strong people don't do because I needed a reminder, don't do these things if you want to stay strong. And then I published my letter online, hoping it might help somebody else, and it went viral. 15 million people read it, and it changed the course of my career. Ever since then, I've been writing and speaking about mental strength and how to give up the bad habits that we all engage in sometimes so that we can make all of our good habits much more effective. You know, everything that you just described, your your life is is very similar to mine. Ten years ago, in a period of six months, my 23-year marriage ended My mother died, and then six months later, my sister died. On top of that, one of my best friends passed away from a brain tumor. She had brain cancer. And this was in such a short period of of my life. And so many people have said to me over the, the course of the past 10 years, you're so brave, you're so strong. How did you do this? And And I've always been fascinated because I have no idea. I know any one of those things could knock someone really you know, down for for quite a long period of time. And I survived all of them, you know, at one time. So I'm interested in learning more about this conversation because I've always wondered what was it that enabled me to move forward and do this work from that. Not only did I survive, I thrived and my life changed. So this is really a, a fascinating conversation that I'm excited about. Right. I just, you know, sorry that you went through all of that as well. And I think it's one of those things, sometimes you don't know how strong you are until you have to be. Mm-hmm. And and then when you get through it and you kind of look back and you think, well, how did I do it? How how come I'm not you know stuck in a in a 
self-pity. How come I'm not uh, somebody who ended up feeling like the world's a terrible, horrible place? I'm not bitter and angry. And I bet you could identify plenty of things that you didn't do that other people who, who do get stuck tend to engage in. And I saw it in my therapy office on a regular basis, people who just did one or two small things. Sometimes it was about identifying, hey, just don't do that anymore. And I promise you, then all of those other good things you're doing will be much more effective. Can we talk about a few of these things that are not the best practices if you want to be mentally strong? What are some of the things we should avoid doing? So I guess one of them would be a big one is to not see vulnerability as a weakness. And for women in particular, sometimes we tend to think that we need to put on our game face at all times and and to try to look like we're tough. And there's a big difference between being strong and being tough. Being tough Mm -hmm. is about trying to appear as though you don't have any problems, that pain doesn't bother you, and that no matter what, you're going to keep going. Whereas being strong sometimes means asking for help. It means admitting you don't have all the answers. It's about really connecting with people and saying to somebody, my feelings are hurt or I'm sorry or... Uh, here's something I'm struggling with. And it takes a lot of strength and courage to be able to do that. But it's key to getting the social support, to reaching out to people who can help you, and to know that you don't have to go it alone. I know one of the things, and, and this is on your list, one, one of the things I had done early on, and especially social media makes it so easy to do, is I would compare my life where I was with the life of others by scrolling through social media. And and so, for example, after my mom passed away on Mother's Day, you talk about being, Mm -hmm. you know, to torture yourself. I would go on social media and I would look at all the wonderful Mother's Day celebrations that my friends were having. And if you get into the practice of doing those types of things that I call self-torture, I could see how that could be a behavior that would keep you stuck. Yes. And it really is a form of self-torture. And yet, Sometimes we try to convince ourselves that we're gaining inspiration from it. So uh, take Instagram, for instance. There's plenty of studies that show Instagram can be really bad for your mental health. And I'm not against social media at all. I use social media, but it's important to be aware of how it affects you. Because we know that for a lot of women, they're scrolling through social media and they're looking at fitness models. They're looking at images of people who appear to have their life all put together and that everything's perfect. And when you constantly... Uh, fill your mind with all these thoughts that other people are happier, healthier, wealthier, and they're doing better in life, it can easily make you feel bad about yourself. And there was a fascinating study that found that men, when they look at images of other men who uh, tend to be doing better, sometimes they gain inspiration. They think, oh, I could be like that someday. But women, when we look at those images, we tend to think, oh, I'll never be as good as she is. Mm-hmm. So I think it's really important to just take a look at how much time you spend doing that, how your thoughts are probably irrational. You don't know how somebody else's life really is. You tell yourself a story about those people that you see. But if it starts to affect the way that you think, if it's affecting the way that you feel, you really need to scale back on, on comparing yourself to other people. So the example that you just used, that leads me to my next question, because you wrote this book now about mentally strong women, and you've written a book about mentally strong people. Are there differences between the things that men and women do and how it impacts mental health? Well, you know, when I wrote the first book, I was just thinking about everybody in general. And then, of course, since that book came out in 2014, lots of things have happened uh, in terms of the Me Too movement and things like that. But I really wanted to know, when it comes to women in particular, how does sort of the societal pressures affect us a little bit differently? And right down to the studies about the way that we raise girls a little bit differently than we do boys, really subtle, small things that we do, but that are giving girls the message that boys are better. There's one study that I found particularly disturbing. When we look at five-year-old kids and we ask them to pick out who they think is brilliant out of a photo lineup, most kids pick out somebody with their own gender. Girls pick out women, boys pick out men. When we do that same study when they're seven, almost all the kids identify men as brilliant. And so I think it's so important just to look at the subtle messages that we give to girls and how do we change, change that so that they don't grow up thinking that they're not as good or that they don't measure up and so that they can have healthy self-worth. So we're talking about the way that we view things, how we think about things, perceive them, messages we may have had, habits. Are there other things that factoring whether or not a person is mentally strong and able to move through challenges? Absolutely. I mean, part of it's genetics, which we can't control. You can't help it if you say we're born with um, ADHD, something like that. You know, it's a biological condition. It's often genetic. 
And a part of it has to do with mental illness as well. There's a big difference between mental strength and mental illness. Sometimes people think that they're um, somehow related. If you have depression or anxiety, it means you're not mentally strong, but that's not true. It's just a complicating factor. Just like mm-hmm. if I wanted to go to the gym and become physically strong, I could still have a physical illness, maybe like diabetes, and that might complicate it, but it doesn't mean I can't still have big muscles. And in and then, of course, our life experiences, the way you were raised, the messages that you got, the core beliefs that you developed as a kid, we hold on to those straight through adulthood. So it's important to really look at, all right, how did I learn? What did I learn about myself? What did I, what kind of beliefs do I have about other people or about the world in general? So unless there's something physical going on, this is really something we have a lot of power over, how we move through challenges, how we create that strength that lets us live an empowered life. We have control over a great deal of this, don't we? Absolutely. It's all about the choices that you make. You know, nobody's born mentally strong. It's all about the choices that you make every day. Do you choose to practice gratitude? Do you choose to calm down when you're upset? Do you choose to have tough conversations even though it's scary? It's all about all the choices that you make. And do you then figure out how do I become a little bit stronger today than I was yesterday? and choosing to grow. Absolutely, anybody can develop more mental strength. And no matter how mentally strong you are, I guarantee there's room for improvement. And I wanted to drive that point home, Amy, because so many people feel like they're a victim to a circumstance or they're a victim to something that's occurring in their life. And they don't have to be. Because I I know in my life, when I went through all of my challenges and I was in a really dark place, For me, I like to describe it as making a choice. Now, it wasn't a flip the switch type of choice. One day I'm sad, the next day everything's great. But I made the choice that I wasn't going to go in the direction of the darkness. And I was going to figure out a way to to empower myself. And at that point, probably I used the word survive. So I think it does come down to a choice. and, And I think, like you're saying, we have so much more power then we really do believe that we do. Yes. And I talk a lot about self-pity and the victim mentality and that sort of a thing, because it's different than being sad, being sad, being angry. Those sorts of things can be part of the healing process, but it's different when you start to host a pity party and you think the whole world is against me. Nobody can solve my problems. All of these solutions that, that are out there won't work for me. And my life is terrible, horrible, and awful. Because when you start believing that, you stay stuck. Because why would you bother to do anything different if you think the world is a terrible, horrible, and awful place? So it's really about then taking action, knowing, okay, I can do something. Maybe you can't change the whole world or you can't change something that already happened, but you can still choose to do something to make your life, somebody else's life, a little bit better. Can you share a story from your book that illustrates mental strength? Oh, sure. Gosh, there's so many. I think... One of my favorites, if I had to pick, would be the story of Catherine Switzer. She was a a woman who had decided to run the Boston Marathon, and it was in the late 60s or early 70s, back before women were allowed to run marathons. And back then, which wasn't that long ago, there was a belief that women just couldn't run that far. And But she signed up for the marathon, and when she signed up, nobody told her she couldn't sign up. She used her initials, so they may not have known she was a woman. Mm -hmm. But anyway, she showed up to the race and just began running with all of these men. And the officials tried to physically knock her off the course, told her she couldn't do it. (laughs) And, um, And she finished, ended up finishing the race. She got tons of hate mail afterward, even from other women who said, what are you trying to prove? Why are you doing this? But I think she's a great example of somebody who didn't necessarily ask permission. She just went out there and showed people. She didn't try to convince them, yes, women can run a marathon. Here's here's why. Here's why you should let me run. She just signed up and did it. And one of the things I talk about in my book is about how uh, how important it is sometimes to break the rules. And it's something that a lot of us women were taught to be polite, to be rule followers. And sometimes you have to break the rules to create change. And I'm not talking about... Uh, just breaking laws haphazardly, but sometimes it's about knowing what are the gender norms that we follow? What are the stereotypes that we end up getting caught up in ourselves that perpetuate the unhealthy stereotypes? How can we do things a little bit differently to create positive change? And of course, we know now it would be ridiculous to think women can't run marathons. Women do it all the time. But she was a trailblazer. She was a pioneer who said, I'm just going to go do this and show that women absolutely can run 26 miles. 
If you could offer someone one tip that could help them develop self-confidence, what would it be? I think it's about um, embracing a little bit of self-doubt. Because a lot of people think, ooh, if I'm a little bit doubtful, I shouldn't try this. Or if I'm not 100% confident, I have no business being here. We look around at other people and think, gosh, they all look really confident. They know what they're doing. I'm the only one who doesn't. But the truth is we all have a little bit of self-doubt. Even if people look like they're 100% confident, they probably aren't. And knowing that self-doubt can can actually improve your performance. When we do studies on people and we say, how are you going to do on this test? People that say, I'm going to ace it tend to actually perform worse than people who say, I'm not really sure if I'm going to pass the test or not. People who have a little bit of self-doubt tend to study harder. So it's one of the things to know that self-doubt isn't a bad thing. Just embrace it and use it to fuel you to do better and to know that sometimes you just have to act brave to then feel brave. So just get out there and do it. The best way to build confidence is through practice and action, not just sitting on the couch wishing you felt more confident. The book is 13 Things Mentally Strong Women Don't Do, Own Your Power, Channel Your Confidence, and Find Your Authentic Voice for a Life of Meaning and Joy. If you'd like to get more information about Amy and her work, you can visit amymorinlcsw.com, or as always, you can visit our website, cyacyl.com, which stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Amy, in our final moments, what's the takeaway? What would you like to leave our listeners with? I'd say to just get out there and know that you can face your fears, you can feel more confident, you can do lots of things to make sure that you reach your greatest potential, but that it only takes one or two bad habits to hold you back and counteract all the good work that you're doing. So I'd say work on identifying what's your worst habit and then try put your energy into eliminating that from your life and then your other habits become much more effective. Amy, thank you so much for joining us and for providing insight that can help us become mentally strong. There are challenges that we face on a daily basis and we certainly can use all the strength we can create. So thank you for spending time with us. Thanks so much for having me. This is Conversations with Joan. Until next time, thanks for tuning in.